Jesus baptized them with the Holy Spirit. It is John that reminds them of the Old Testament teachings of the promise of the Father that was connected to the first coming of Christ. Now, he didn't, of course, the, in the Old Testament, we didn't call it the first coming of Christ. We just called it the coming of Christ. What separates the first coming from the second coming theologically is the presence of Christ on, on, on the earth going to the cross, dying, being resurrected, and sending back to the Father. So taking all, that, taking all that into account, John the Baptist is the one who said, I come baptizing, Matthew 3.11, I come baptizing in water to identify who the Messiah is. And when he comes, he is of a higher rank in God. He's of higher rank in the calling of God than I am. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 12, he says, and fire, and he explains it, the second coming of Christ, the baptism of fire. Jesus talks about John came, baptized in water, in order to identify who the Messiah was, who the actual person of the prophetic Christ would be. That's, for, that's John, the first chapter. It's very clear. It's easy to read, and you can understand it. The baptism of fire after he comes, he will go back to the Father, and he'll come on the second coming. He will give baptism of fire. Now, a lot of people confuse that, and because there is fire mentioned at Pentecost, they think that's what they're talking about. He is not talking about that. He is talking about Joel, though, which connects him. But Joel is talking about, the, Joel is interested in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not the baptism of fire. But he does mention both of these when he talks about the, the sun uh, going dark and the moon and all that business. But remember, when you read Old Testament prophecies about the coming of Christ, there's not a differential of the first coming from the second coming. That was the mystery of the church who sets between them. Now, if you can get that, then we're, we're on the road here. To understanding some things. So, now what we're going to do in today's lesson, after I have a word of prayer with you, is this. Jesus kept talking about the promise from the Father. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. He called it the promise of the Father. Now, what's important about a promise from the Father is how it's fulfilled. Aren't you interested in that when you find a promise from the Father? How is it fulfilled? Well, I hope so. Otherwise, this whole journey of faith would be kind of nebulous. And so, he, what we're going to talk about today is the fulfillment of the promise of the Father, which is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. When we come back to a word of prayer, we're going to get into it under the next following five, five points. They're very important. And you're going to have to have your thinking cap on. This is not a time to be lazy <laughs> at Bible study. This is an essential, basic, principled doctrine. Let's pray. Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. These must be confessed in silence. Because carnality has removed you from the dynamics of the indwelling Holy Spirit called spirituality. Because you have chose to gratify your flesh by sin. Confession of that puts you back into the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit called spirituality. Confession of your sin. One verse, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin or sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. The cleansings, it's not about salvation now. That deal's over. This is about spirituality in the ministry power of the Holy Spirit for learning. So, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray that they would have exercised the ministry of the Holy Spirit for John 14, 26. Jesus said when he comes, he indwells, he will give you an anointing. Like in 1 John 2, he says to teach and recall the word of God from the human soul of a believer. And so, Father, we look for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to talk about five things today. 
one of the one of the one of the reasons the church age is one of the most unique periods of biblical history is Jesus fulfilling the promise to baptize with the Holy Spirit. It is essential. It is everything. And over the course of the next five weeks on this very subject, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to lay out this as simple as I know how for you to grasp the dynamics of the importance because of what makes the dynamics of the day in which you and I live, which is the last days, you and I live in the last days of the dynamics of the Holy Spirit's ministry to the world that we live in, the world we live in. I mean the world you live in where your life touches so many other people. And so we want to talk about that today in part two of the baptism, the one baptism, which is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things that I think is important for you to understand where I'm going to take you now, the bapt when Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's going to do two things that are really important. It's Number one, it's going to incorporate all the believers of the Old Covenant into one body, the church. The other thing it's going to do is to inaugurate the coming of the Holy Spirit into a dynamics of a dispensation called the church age. These two things are really important. In the weeks to come, I'm going to explain the difference between them and lay the argument out for it. What we're looking at today is the fulfillment of the Father's promise of sending His Son to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So I, here's what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to look at the fulfillments. There are five of them I want to pay attention. I want you to pay attention to that make this important. Here's number one: the prophecy of John the Baptist. Now we call him John the Baptist. They called him the prophet. They called him John the prophet, who baptized in the Jordan water. They called him the baptizer because he baptized in the Jordan looking for the Messiah. How do I know that? Because I've read John, the first chapter. I've read that. And it's very clear what he was looking for. Everybody knew that John the Baptist or John the baptizer, everybody knew he was a prophet sent from God. They all knew that. In fact, every time the religious leaders got, got fired up and wanted to shut him up, they were afraid of it because the people, the masses of the people knew he was a prophet. Okay? Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11, tells you that he had come as a prophet to introduce us to Christ and what Christ would do. That Christ, when he would come, he would give two baptisms that was clear in the Old Testament under the New Covenant. He would bring two baptisms, one at the beginning of his ministry and one at the end. One at the beginning would be baptism by the Holy Spirit. The one at the end would be baptism of fire. Now, if you know anything about, about eschatology, one of the great doctrines of the second coming or the end days is the doctrine called the baptism of fire. It's a new covenant doctrine. It's an old covenant doctrine that now is on the front burner of the church age. We are looking for the second coming. Every time we take part in the Eucharist, we do this in anticipation of proclaiming the coming of Christ. When he comes, baptism of fire. Okay? That's, that's the deal. All right. So in Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11 in verse 11, he says that when he comes, when Christ comes, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. He said, I came baptized in water. He will come baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's important you understand that. Now, when you read John 1, and I just gave you read the whole chapter. <laughs> John 1. Look, it's not a difficult read. It's not that long. Come on. It's an easy read. It's not hard. But it's John 1, 30 through 34, for sure, for sure. 
And you, you want to see that. Let's just, let's just go there. I want to show you how easy this book is. It's not a difficult book. It would be a little more difficult if you had to exegete it. But it's not. If you, had to, if you had to do it all out in the Greek, it would be a little difficult. But it's not. It's easy reading. I Just drop down there. Uh, if you have a study Bible, you're in what's called the testimony of John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, starting verse 19. I, I just want to pick up uh, verse 29 the next day. Uh, he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, after, that's the next day after his baptism. He said, behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sin of the world. Watch verse 30. This is he. Now, he's talking about Messiah. They all knew that. John baptized him. John's ministry is done. Jesus' ministry has started. He declares, here's the Lamb of God that's come to take one. They all knew what he's talking about, that shadow Christology. That's all, the, that's all of the Old Testament shadow Christology, all the festivals and offerings and sacrifices and yada, yada. Verse 30, he says, This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me, that's what he preached and preached and preached and preached at every baptismal service, everything he preached. After me comes a man who is of higher rank. Now, he is top. He, listen, he's the top of the chain. He's the prophet of God to Israel. And this guy's higher than him. That means Christ. The only person higher than a prophet to the nation was Christ himself, the Son of God. Behold, the Son of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now we know from Luke, that John the baptizer, the cousin of Christ, John is six months older than Jesus. We know that. The word of God is clear on it in Luke 1 and 2. And yet he says that he existed before me. But we knew that. Listen to me. We didn't know it because we looked up their birth records. We know it because he said that he was of higher rank in the divine kingdom than I went in, which means he had to exist before. Christ existed before. Cr Listen, Christ existed before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1. And let that sink for a minute. Higher rank than I existed before me. Watch this. I did not recognize him. That's his cousin. What's he mean he didn't recognize him? We've read the story of Luke 1 and 2. He didn't recognize him. Didn't recognize him as the Messiah. Watch this now. I didn't recognize him, but in order that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. This is how God... This is. He said, well, why did John baptize in water? Because God told him to. God told him to do it that way. And here's what he said. And I didn't recognize him, but he would come to baptize in water. He upon, here's what the Father told him of why to baptize in water. He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one, watch this, this is the one, watch this now, you're missing it. Are you looking at it? Yeah. It does what? What's he going to do? He's going to baptize. What? He's going to, who baptizes you in what? In the Holy Spirit. Watch. He upon whom you see the Spirit descending rain upon him, this is the one who will, in other words, when John baptized every, every, every Jewish male in the water that professed faith in the gospel of Christ, he looked for this to happen. What's he looking for? 
he is looking for, he's in water, he's looking for the Holy Spirit to descend and remain upon him because this is the one who is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized nobody during his earthly ministry. He didn't even baptize anybody in water for, so that there would be no confusion about his baptism. This baptism of the Holy Spirit by Jesus Christ is not going to occur while he's on earth. It's going to occur after he goes back and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father in heaven. Is he going to do that? You know why you go to this church? Because you're not going to hear this. You're not going to hear this. And you've got to ask yourself, why has God brought me to this church for this teaching for this time? You've got to answer that question. Why do you think God has set you in here to give you this correct teaching? And I'll tell you why it's correct, because I document it out of the word of God. I've not told you anything you couldn't understand, have I? I've just pointed them out. He goes on, I have seen and I bear witness that this guy is the son of God, not just Christ, but who he really is. Who he really is, is the son of God. He's not just Na Jesus from Nazareth. He's just not the Messiah who would come to Israel. He is the Son of God. That's why he holds higher rank. And I just gave you a little bit of John 1. John 1 is well worth a read. And so, prophecy fulfilled. The prophecy given to John has been fulfilled. Baptize in water until you baptize the Messiah. You will see the Holy Spirit come down and rest on him. He will remain on him until you see it clearly. It's upon this one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit, right? Come on now. All right, come on now. I just read that. John the Baptist's fulfillment came when he baptized Jesus of Nazareth, declared him to be the Christ, the Son of God, and that he would baptize in the Holy Spirit. Agreed? That day of prophecy of the Old Testament has been fulfilled. You understand that? With the baptism of John. He identified the person who would now one day baptize in the Holy Spirit. Would you, would you agree with that? No? I can talk another hour on it. Or I can go to point two. All right. See, my job is not to convince you. My job is to teach you. It makes my job a little bit easier on me. When I find out, I don't have to convince you. But I do have to explain to you what you must believe. All right, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. The pre... Pre-resurrection, pre-resurrection declaration of fulfillment by Jesus is going to begin at Pentecost. It's going to begin at Pentecost. Jesus is now, before his resurrection, before he is, dies on a cross, buried and raised, prior to that, I call it pre-resurrection, Jesus makes a declaration and we look for the fulfillment. Watch this. I'm in John, so let's go 16. Let's go John 16. John, you, you, you remember now, this is really important, upper room discourse. The upper room discourse before Christ goes to the cross, just before he goes to the cross, he has the upper room discourse, which is discussed in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. There's a heavy Bible study. 
on new covenant thinking. Listen, and he talks a lot about the coming of the Holy Spirit, which means he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he's going to talk about the dynamics of what that means. John 14, 15, and 16, he goes into great detail. I mean, enormous detail of the ministry. Once he baptizes with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to have ministry. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit's going to do the work. Look at John 16, verse 7 and 8. Now, he's been talking about, in chapter 14, chapter 15, now we're in chapter 16, he's still talking about what it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When he comes, what he'll do. Now, watch verse 7. I love you. Always pay attention in the scriptures when Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, or truly, truly, I say unto you, or truly, I say unto you, you always pay attention to that statement because he's going to give you a nugget of Bible doctrine that's essentially important. Watch what he says. But I tell you the truth. Isn't it funny that he has to always remind the people that he's teaching the truth? Because there were so many people in attendance that questioned everything he said like you do with me. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. To whose advantage? It is to your advantage that I what? That I go away. Every time he talked about going away, everybody cried. <laughs> he says, you're missing the whole point about me going away. Every time I say go away, you all fall apart. Listen, you've got to change your attitude. It is a good thing to you. It is a good thing for you that I go away. I don't know what's possible. You just got here. It is a good thing for you. It is your advantage. It benefits you. It's a plus for you that I go away. Watch what he says. Watch the for if I don't or if I do. Watch this now. If I don't and if I do. Watch what he says. For if I do not go away, the helper, comforter, which is the Holy Spirit that he will baptize, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Not baptize you, baptize you in the Holy Spirit. The helper shall come to you, but if I go, see, if I do not go away, the comforter shall not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. I'm going to go away. I won't be here, but I'm going to send him to you. I won't be here. I'm going away. I'm going on a long distant trip. Now, they're about to learn that tomorrow and for the next three days. They're going to learn that. He's going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried on third day, raised from the dead. And this is not going to happen until I go away. And if I go away, then it's going to be your benefit. It's going to be a plus on your life. It's going to be a positive, a positive on your life. If I don't go away, it won't be. If I do go away, it will be. You got to change your attitude. What's he talking about? He's talking about him baptizing you with the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, it says, and when he comes, here's the advantage. And when he comes, where's he going to come to? We know he's going to come within the body of a believer. He's going to indwell a body of a believer. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And it goes on to explain it. Think about that. Where does this great ministry of judgment, of conviction, of judgment and righteousness and sin come from? It comes from in the well of your water to the world. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives inside you, John 7, 37 through 39. 
that gives water of life to a thirsty world. It is the well that is inside you called the Holy Spirit because Jesus baptized you with the Holy Spirit. This is not the same thing as the Holy Spirit baptizing. This is Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, baptizing you. Not the third member, the second member doing it. It is missed in the theology of the church. Well, John, the seventh chapter, listen to what he says. Jesus in the seventh chapter lays this out. John, I'm just picking and choosing passages for you. On the last day, John, the seventh chapter, verse 2, last day of what? Feast of the Jews called the Feast of Tabernacles or Booth. On the last day, which is kind of important to that festival, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and said, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost beings shall flow rivers of living water. He told that to the, the gal. He taught that to the Samaritan woman in John 4. Watch verse 39. But he spoke of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He had not risen from the dead, ascended back to the Father, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Not going to happen till then. Not going to happen till then. You got that? Whoa. Third, watch this one. Post-resurrection, after his resurrection, the declaration of the fulfillment by Jesus beginning at Pentecost. Watch this. Luke, you got your Bible? Go to Luke 24. The two guys on the road to Emmaus, two disciples, they're bewildered about Jesus dying on the cross, being buried, and declared raised from the dead. 24th chapter, and he, he drops in on them. This is post-resurrection appearances of 40 days, one of them, before he ascends back to the Father. We're in Luke 24. Luke 24. I'm going to pick up a verse 46. He's walking along with them. He opens their mind to the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written. That's Old Testament prophecy. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And as Jesus said, it was prophesied in the life of Jonah, right? Three days and three nights business. And that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Watch verse 49. Watch out now. And behold, this means pay close attention. The word behold, pay close attention. I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. You know what the promise of the Father was? That Jesus would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Now pay attention. Pay attention. But you are to stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. You know what the power from on high will be? The Holy Spirit. It's coming. Stay in the city. After I leave, stay in the city. Now, go to Acts. Let's turn over to Acts, the first chapter of Acts. Watch this. Jesus is about to leave the earth by ascension to go into session and then give the baptism of the Spirit. All right? Here's how this thing is going down. Look at verse 3. To these he, Christ, also himself alive, presented himself alive after his suffering, crucifixion, 
burial, by many convicting proofs, post-resurrection appearances, to them over a period of how many days? Now, this, this is important. You know when his resurrection came? He got Passover, unleavened bread. In that period of unleavened bread, Passover is one day, the first day. Then you got seven days of unleavened bread. In the middle of unleavened bread is called first fruit. First fruit. It's the day after the weekly Sabbath. It's called first fruits. And from first fruits, which, by the way, is the day he was raised from the dead, first fruits, 50 days later, is Pentecost. On the button. The 40 days he's talking about is between first fruits and Pentecost. 50 days from first fruits is Pentecost. He's going to leave the earth 40 days after his resurrection and many post resurrection appearances to his disciples. How many days do I have left? 10. What did he tell them to do? I got 10 days before Pentecost, right? I got 40. I got, okay, I got 10 days. What do you tell them to do? Wait in Jerusalem for the Father's promise that he had been talking about to them. All right. Here I go. 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me, John baptized you with water. Watch this now. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What? How many days? Not many days. How many do we know that really is historically? Ten. You know what 10 days is going to be from this? It's going to be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What day, what Jewish festival is that going to be? Pentecost. Right? <laughs> See, you got Passover, then you got unleavened bread. In the middle of unleavened bread, you got first fruit. First fruit takes you to Pentecost. All four things are wrapped into one great event. Now, let me show you something else. In the book of Acts, like we got, look at verse 4. The promise. What the Father had promised. In other words, they can find that in the Old Testament. They can find it through the teachings of Jesus. Now, watch this. Acts, go to Acts, the second chapter. I wrote this on your paper. Acts 2.33. Look at this. Now we're at Pentecost. Acts 2 is Pentecost. Pentecost, the Jewish festival. Peter is preaching. 2.33. In verse 32, he says, he, he, in verse 31, he says, well, he goes back and he says, Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He went to Hades. This Jesus God, verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Look at verse 33. Therefore, look at now. Pay attention. I'm going to give you one, two, three. I'm going to give you one, two, three. Pay attention because you're going to miss it. I'm going to give you point one, two, and three. Watch this now. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God the Father, that's what we call session. He's been raised from the dead, 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. He ascends. Chap Acts 1 11, he ascends back to the Father. They see him going out through the clouds. And now he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in session. Watch this. Number one, having been exalted to the right hand of God, he's got to be there. That's an, that's, he's got to be there. Two, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Two, Three, he has poured forth that which you both hear and see, Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. One, two, three, the order of progression. Please tell me you see that. Verse 
Verse 39. For the promise, now we know what he's talking about. He's talking about the promise of the Father, is for you and for your children, and here is you and I. Here's you and I. You and, you and I, you and me, you and me. And for all who are far off, now we all know we're a little off, and I'm probably far off. And for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself, We're the far off. Hello, Alabama. Hello, Alabama. Let's take a look at four. Post-ascension session. Declaration of fulfillment. I gave it to you in verse 39. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, listen to me. I don't have time to go through all this, but you're good readers. You got college education. If not, you should have you should have went because you're smart enough. Everybody in here is smart enough. The fact that you didn't choose to go to college don't mean you're not smart. You were smart enough not to choose it. It just proves anybody can make it. This is America. God bless America. Peter talks about this at Pentecost, Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 6. You know what he's talking about there? He's talking about the pivot of old covenant believers. You know who's at Pentecost? Hey, do you know who's at Pentecost? Jews. You know who the, what Jews these are? These are the ones that God handpicked to come to see the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of his beloved son. These are the believers that are going to leave Pentecost and evangelize the world of their generation. Where are we in that picture? You know how, why they're going to do it? Because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sixteen different languages were spoke that day by Galileans uneducated in the eyes of the people, yet they spoke with great clarity the languages of 16 different nations or languages represented at Pentecost. They heard him preach the gospel of Jesus Christ by 16 different interpreters, by one interpreter, 16 different languages through the baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And you know who they all were? All of them! were Jews, either proselyte Jews or Jews by birth. And they were there because, of, because they had faith in the prophetic gospel of Jesus Christ. And they saw the greatest event in human history. They saw Jesus die on a cross for the sins of the world as a Lamb of God. They heard him raised from the dead and the temple was done, put out of order. People were raised out of the grave and went back into the city and proclaimed the power of resurrection. And Pentecost comes and then Jesus baptizes those there and the Holy Spirit declares the gospel of Christ in 16 different languages through Galileans. Now, I don't even have anybody to compare to Galileans today. Amen. Well, here's what, where's, here's where did the promise of the Father come from? It came from Joel, the second chapter, 28, 32. Where did it come from? He quotes all these. In Acts 2, he quotes all these. It comes from Psalms. 110, verse 1. It comes from Psalms 16, 8 through 11. He, he, he declared, Peter declares all these Bible verses as being fulfilled at Pentecost. When Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't do it. Jesus did it. The Holy Spirit didn't baptize then. Jesus did it.
Listen to this. Acts 2.32, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God, one. Two, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, three. He poured forth that which you both see and hear. You know, you know what Acts 2, listen, Acts 2, 16 and 17, you know what the Bible called Pentecost of Acts 2, called it the last days? Identified that period as the last days. Think about that. Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit was sugar proof that we were in the last days. He had come, died on a cross, was buried, raised from the dead, ascended, was seated at the right hand of God the Father. You're in the last days. The entire ministry of the church is to the last days. We have forgotten that. We have forgotten it. This little dinky church ought to be filled every Sunday with people who have been ministered by you as you go out into community and tell them the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. For if what they're missing is a whole lot of dynamic stuff in their life. They don't understand how their life has been benefited by Jesus Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, ascending back to the Father and baptizing in the Holy Spirit. I haven't talked a thing about the Holy Spirit baptizing. That's a subject way away from this. I'm strictly talking today and for the next five, the next five lessons I've got. I'm in the third one, uh, the second one. All about the baptism of the Holy Spirit has nothing to do. I haven't talked. I'm not interested in the Holy Spirit baptizing at this point. That's a whole nother subject about it. I can't go there until you understand this. I'll give you a little study guide. In Acts, the second chapter, verse 42, I'm not going to teach this today. I put it there for home study. Four orders of assembly worship of the Christian church are established in Acts 2.42. You want to guide your assembly worship and see Every time you assemble weekly, we assemble weekly, Tuesday, Wednesday, as a church. A body of believers assembling. You know, if I told you that if you would come to Tuesday night Bible study, a lottery tickets are going to be, and everybody there has a 1 in 22 chance to win, would you not go? Man, you're part of something bigger than anything like that. I mean, you drive halfway across town, uh, buy one, get one. I'm not opposed to that idea. I'm opposed to the idea that you don't come to Bible study. It's called the church in assembly. There's four things that transpire in a church in assembly. And for us, we try to reach this every uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday. It takes three meetings with our people because they're time-oriented. It takes us three times to get this done. Go in there and read and see if your church does these things. This is the order of service in assembly hour. But listen, you've got to have assembly to get this done. Assembly for me is not the Internet. I am appreciative of those who can't come who live all over the world and out of state that are able to attend. I love that. That's called ministry out. That ministry would not go out of this church if we didn't have assembly because I wouldn't be teaching. I teach in assembly. That's my call. I'm an assembly teacher. And you should go in there and look at that because that's the marching order. And you got to have assembly to have this order. I can't, I can't do this without assembly. And look, if you think our meeting time is not appropriate, come to Tuesday night, tell me what you want. We'll talk it as a group and we'll change it. 
I'll teach you any day. Listen, I don't care what day I teach. I don't care what hours I teach. I'll teach any hours you want to assemble. The fifth and final promise to new covenant believers of Jesus, baptizing with holy, fulfilled at Pentecost. Listen to this. Acts 2, 38 and 39. I'm going to close with it. I give you all that. You ought to read Galatians 4, 9, 4, 4, 3, 14 and Ephesians 1, 13 because he talks about the promise from the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. You ought, to, you ought to read that in context. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. And so we are. Alabama. I'm talking about the state now, Alabama. Far off. How blessed I am. How blessed I am to have you as a congregation. I don't tell you enough how appreciative I am of you. I don't tell you enough. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you, Father, for the study of your word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful thing, the baptism that Jesus gave of the Holy Spirit, and what a powerful thing it is for the Holy Spirit to baptize, which is a whole other subject in itself. We're looking at the incorporation and inauguration of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of Jesus Christ of the Holy Spirit. We're about to take an offering, Father, and we give not out of the law, but we give out of grace and we give out of the joy of giving. And this is a wonderful congregation that does it, Father, and we try to be great stewards of that money that they give us to spend a little on ourselves and as most, most of it on missions and ministry. And we're thankful for everything you give us, Father, everything. We take none of it. For granted, but we do take it for grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.